I'm Aaron Straker. Today we are in the kitchen making meals for getting jacked and strong. Today we are making cube chicken, white rice, and garlic green beans. Back in 2012, 2013, while I was um, deep, deep in the CrossFit world, I was in my early 20s still, or pushing like my mid 20s, and my body just started falling apart. Um, so I like kind of rolled a few really big injuries, tendon ruptures, uh, one after another, a couple of surgeries. And I kind of hit a, uh, like reached a point where I was like, my, why is my body failing? You know what I mean? I'm 24 years old, 25 years old. And I'm, you know, rupturing my Achilles tendon. I'm having all these like older man injuries. And what it really came down to was like outside of the gym, my lifestyle wasn't very conducive to the type of training I was doing. So my sleep was really bad. My nutrition was absolute shit. And it was just all came to a head, all the high intensity training. We wasn't, I wasn't taking like rest days and stuff and just not knowing anything about my food consistently, like really under eating, afraid of carbohydrates because I was deep in the paleo world. And it just, my, all the aspects weren't adding up. And it wasn't until these injuries where I had these, you know, seven months off because I was, you know, immobilized in a, in a cast to really dig into some other aspects of my life. And that's when everything really started to change. And then as things got better, I was like, oh, wow, this is massive. And, uh, yeah. on with it. and it's been incredible. You know, I'm a couple years deep in my business now here. I'm 32 years old and I feel better than I did when I was 22. And what I'm most Isn't that awesome? Incredible. And I think that, like now I, I just continue to go not only deeper for my own self, kind of self-exploration on like, my, my next goal is like at 42. I want to feel and look better than I do at 32. Um, and it's just like, I want to anti-age basically. Right? <laughs> All right. With really putting a lot of your nutrition, sleep and lifestyle factors in the forefront of that and like taking charge of your health in that uh, avenue, you really can kind of really delay the aging process until you really start to hit some of the, you know, physiological um, hormonal changes that, you know, maybe occur in your like fifties and stuff like that. Yeah. That's the goal. You know, I want to, I want to feel like I'm 20 for as long as possible. And I know that nutrition is like one of the largest parts of that. And uh, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Dude, I just turned 37 last week. And if I stacked all of my strength and conditioning numbers up against my 22 to like 27, eight, nine year old self, 37 year old Anders smashes. Oh yeah. Mid -20s that's 20s Anders. There, there, there's this kind of, um, obviously with, with the year hasn't started off as I was, as everyone, <laughs> there's always this long standing, um, story. I told myself that 32 is when I'm going to be. And I just started telling myself this when I was like 25, because it was far enough away that I would like, I'll figure it out when I get closer. Yeah. You know? And I know that just with everything I've learned with, with nutrition, I was like, I know, like, if I want to go take down my all time strength numbers, I know how to periodize for that. Like I know yeah. What I'm going to do nutrition wise to support it, how much training per day, like the things that are going to get removed from my life for other external stressors. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's tangible. And I know yeah. that so much of it is just that now. Dude, 32 was not the year that I peaked. 32 was the year that I broke. <laughs> yeah. So I broke like at 25. So, yeah. come on. Um, rad dude. Well, I wanted to get on here and do this one. I think doing a live cooking show is so rad, uh, mm -hmm. because you're in Columbia, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we get to hang out. How radical. Um, but also while we're cooking this meal, we get to talk about, um, kind of your, your program, um, how you're getting people, you know, much leaner and stronger all at the same time and how, we can kind of structure a meal. I, I'm not sure a hundred percent of the people like really understand how to cook a meal and how to read macros and what goes into sitting down and saying, okay, this is my meal plan. This is the prescription of where my nutritionist told me to be. And then it's like, go. And what yeah. they probably do is they take a chicken breast and put it on a scale and that tastes like ass. And the next thing you find yourself a week later, you're like, I just can't eat another chicken breast. I've been there only like a thousand times in my life where I'm like, no more chicken breast. I can't do it. Um, but we can make really delicious, healthy food that fix or fits our macros is goal specific. And that's what we get to do today. Yeah. So uh, give a little bit of a brief background. Um, 
Just to clarify, I'm in Columbia in South America, not Columbia, South Carolina. South Carolina, Carolina. yeah. <laughs> that would be way close to me. You're way yeah. far away. Oh, that's like an hour away. <laughs> <laughs> like, why didn't you just travel? <laughs> the ingredients and stuff I have are going to be a little different because um, one thing I found through a lot of my travels, no one does grocery stores like the United States. Um, that is like a super overlooked aspect of traveling. <laughs> Some things are a little bit different. But I'm not a big meal plan person, and the reason why is it comes back to education. Like when you truly understand the, the the foods and the types of things you need for your diet, putting together your meal plan is very simple. Uh, so a couple of different things that I like to use are a, 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 a kind of like a project tool called a, a meals matrix. And what it is, you have like proteins, carbohydrates, vegetables, fruits, fats, and then some spices and stuff. And you just list like the ones that you are realistically most um, commonly going to eat. And there's been actually a good amount of research on it. Most people only eat about 10 to 12 different meals that you're cooking for yourself. Um, and then from that, you just kind of mix and match. And that makes it really, really simple to know, like I can eat these things consistently well. I like them. Um, and that's how I do my own personal diet. I'm not, you know, really crazy, especially me. I eat a lot of food and I don't want to be in the kitchen hours, you know, yeah. cook super fancy meals. And then I, I eat it in seven minutes. And I'm like, I just spent 50 minutes making that and it's gone. Yeah. So, um, everything that we're going to talk about today is you can do really, really efficiently, um, really repeatably. And I have some good spices and seasonings here that I like to use. And I'm going to show you guys how to make a really, really good meal that's a really, really quality. And we're going to talk about the different components of it. And uh, it's going to be pretty sweet. Savage. What are we making? All right. So, what we are going to do is we have diced, uh, or sorry, not diced, cubed chicken breast that we're going to pan fry. We have. Um, White rice, it's going in the rice cooker, which I have back there, which is like the staple carbohydrate for myself. It doesn't get any easier than that. And then we are going to be doing garlic green beans, uh, steamed, steam slash uh, stir fried garlic green beans, which are phenomenal. Probably my favorite vegetable right now. Beautiful. Um, what are we looking at on like a, a macro breakdown? So it really depends. It's going to be a lower fat um, meal, uh, specifically because I tend to follow a more, um, higher carbohydrate diet, uh, for myself, for clients specifically, because we most often talk about body composition and performance in the gym, but we have, it's going to be really high protein because it, it's, it's a really lean chicken. And for what we kind of make it out to be, it can be really scalable. Um, at the end, I can kind of put together some numbers based on how I would weigh it out based on how I would typically eat. And then we can talk about that from there. What are, what are your, what are your like main goals? We can, we can do this while you're cooking. Cause I'll talk to you forever. Um, what are your main goals just when you start to analyze your own diet? Like what, what are you looking at? What are you trying to achieve when you, when you sit down to make meals now? First thing is nutrient density. So that is one area that I think a lot of people can see immediate improvement. So I use a tool called chronometer for my food tracking and yeah, incredibly robust because it's the, to my knowledge, the only food tracking application that's not only going to tell you your macros, but it's going to tell you your breakdown of your fat between saturated fat, your polyunsaturated fat, your monounsaturated fat, your omega profile, your vitamins, minerals, and that you can see like, um, hey, maybe I'm, um, what's an example, like I'm really lethargic, you know, in the middle of the day or something like that, but you can see like you're not, your B, your B suite of vitamins, that you're, you know, nowhere near the recommended uh, daily intake for that. So you can make improvements based on the information it gives you. Uh, it has a lot of really generic um, food entries, which really help with that because they get full uh, reporting depth too. So that's what I really like. Food density, I think is the biggest, regardless of if you're trying to lose weight, gain weight, you know, just improve body composition or eat a healthier diet, paying attention to the vitamin and mineral nutrient density of your diet is going to be the first big win for everyone across the board. Beautiful. Um, where are we starting? What are we doing? Cooking uh, chicken? So what I'm going to do first is start with the rice cooker because it's the simplest, and then we set it, forget it, and it does its thing. Beautiful. I, the rice cooker is probably my favorite thing. Um, I buy one in every single country we go to. This is the <laughs> Wait, you can't travel with one? I mean, if you think about how big a rice cooker is and how much, like, everything. That's true, is, yeah. And they're so cheap. It's like $20. So yeah, like, yeah. Like five times a week, I would gladly spend twenty dollars and leave it in the Airbnb when we leave for a rest. Yeah, um, Your little added benefit of having you as the guest. Yeah, right. You get a little kitchen addition. Yeah, instead of someone stealing a fork, you're leaving them a rice cooker. 
So it usually comes with a little cup here. This one is really small too. Um, it's only makes six cups or five cups, which is still a massive amount of rice for if it's yeah. your you know significant other just you. So I would just go with the smallest ones. And what I do is you get this little cup here that it comes with, fill it up to the top. I'm going to do uh, two cups of rice, so it cooks a little bit faster here for us. Or sorry, two little you know plastic cups, not necessarily a, a cup. And then what I do here is equal parts water to rice. So I'm just going to Why is white rice like the go-to for every meathead that exists in the world? Yeah, so the so the only so there's just like this huge um, I don't want to call it like huge, but this ongoing thing with rice about brown rice versus white rice. So they're the same rice. White rice is just a little bit more processed because it has the outer um, casing removed. And the reason why white rice for like your, your meatheads or people who are trying to build a lot of muscles, it's easier to digest. Brown rice contains a compound called phytic acid that some people have digestion issues with. So yeah. some, well, brown rice like makes them bloat, they get gas, but white rice is perfectly fine. Um, for me, I can digest both uh, equally is fine. The reason I go with white rice is because it cooks in like a fourth of the time that brown rice did because it doesn't have that outer um, that outer uh, casing, which has a little bit more fiber. But for me, I mean, when I'm eating at maintenance, I'm blowing through fiber. I'll do like 60, 70 grams of fiber a day because I eat so much vegetables. Yeah. So using three grams or five grams of fiber on my rice, when I'm doubling the RDA on, on, on fiber, I'm okay. Um, in the time, right? I want to be efficient. I don't want to spend all day in the kitchen. So I want this stuff to cook. All right. So I have my equal parts water and rice in here. And then what I do is put just a little bit of have some uh, olive oil here, just a little bit on top, like a very, very tiny amount. And then uh, some uh, sea salt here. So put that on top. The sea salt just kind of helps, but it kind of cooks into the rice as the as everything evaporates and the rice expands. Yeah. And it gives it a really good little bit of extra taste in there. So I have that. What I'm going to do is throw this guy in the rice cooker here. I plug it in. You set the top on and you press the little button and it literally does its thing. In like seven to 12 minutes, rice is done. Um, it doesn't get any easier than that. Nice. Um, dude, when, you, uh, when you're working with people, what do you feel like some of the, the largest um, things holding you back? I've had this interesting thought lately that and, and I'm sure you've seen it, that in, in the fitness space, I think at like globally, we spend a lot of time trying to get people to eat a little bit less because as a whole, we are overweight. Yeah. Um, but in the fitness industry, I feel like we under eat so much because everybody is trying to get so shredded and so lean, but they've been eating in a caloric deficit for like three years. Yeah. And in- can you go back to what the very first part of the question was? Oh, yeah. Um, like, do you see more people um, coming to you with some gym experience, some nutrition experience that are just under eating as yeah. more of a habit? Or do you see more people coming to you um, kind of in that over fat state? Like, I feel like in the fitness space, under eating is a much bigger problem than the overeating. Yeah, so what you get is a little bit of both. So what happens when people are chronically, you know, under eating for long periods of time is your body adapts to that. It's called it's a process called metabolic adaptation. And it's your body getting like thrifty with spending its you know calories um, because it knows that like not like it's it's getting less than it needs, right? So yeah. it's be efficient and it's not going to spend you know, tons of calories like on, on your, your thyroid, you know, operating normally when your thyroid's what helps you, you know, lose weight and saying, hey, you don't need to lose more weight. Like we're, we're net negative. We, like we need to slow down. Yeah. So that, that over a large period of time is your body. I mean, come on, we're, we're the most, you know, evolved species on planet earth. Like it's not like we're, we're tricking our, you know, physiology. Yeah. Anymore. And it just gets smarter and it slows it down. So what happens with that when everything starts to, you know, really start slowing down, especially when you're talking about people who are dieting for six months, eight months, these long durations, is you reach a point of diminishing returns where um, 
testosterone is down, your sex hormones are down, because your stress hormone cortisol is higher, and you end up where you can actually start putting body fat back on, and your weight increases, even though you're trying to like squeeze more out of the you know the the, the wet rag, but it's a dry, it's been dry, and you're still you know cranking on, and then you end up going the opposite direction. Or, yeah. But or from you know that's more the physiological standpoint. The psychological standpoint is you get people who are dieting so hard you know during the weeks and stuff and they've been doing it for so long and then they get that uh, i don't want to call it the binge mentality but then they have you know blowout days or just like weekend cheats or binges or whatever and because their deficit has basically been eradicated from out from the week because their body has their metabolism slowed down to become basically a net push when they have that big day on saturday or whatever their week is now in a net surplus so even though they're like still trying more, they just keep getting, you know, little by little, I don't yeah. know, putting weight on because they're, they've reached that point of diminishing returns. Yeah. And that's kind of what happens. And from a diet uh, side of it, a lot of it is because we're, we've reached this point in, you know, in technology and stuff where you don't have to eat. Like, people, most people don't eat foods like this. No. Stuff in packages, stuff that you like pop in the microwave in a bag and it inflates and stuff. And those foods are just, they're, they're nutrient sparse and calorie dense. So a lot of times what I'll do is like if someone's scared about, you know, a lot of times when I start working with a new client, people are scared to eat more, right? And because they think like, oh, I don't want to eat more. I'm going to, I want to lose weight, not gain weight. But what we do is like, if I, if you're coming to me eating really simple number, 2000 calories, what I'm going to do is transition you to 2,000 calories of like, you know, boxed foods, cereals and stuff, to 2,000 calories of, you know, lean meats, simple starchy carbohydrates, complex starchy carbohydrates and vegetables. And yeah. It was like if we weigh your entire diet of 2,000 calories of, you know, what you were doing before, let's say it weighs like three pounds. Um, when I just switch that with real foods, we can now eat like twice the volume and weight of food at the same amount of calories. So you can stretch. Yeah. You know whole food sources so much further than you can with not so from a satiety standpoint most people are even more full they don't want to eat that much because of, you know it's just twice the amount of actual food intake but equal amount of calorie intake yeah um dude your program metabolic performance hold protocol. on the last part protocol um so many big words like so many big words can you uh break that down a little bit i think uh it, when, as soon as you start saying the word metabolism to people they freak out a little bit they don't really know what that means but they've heard it they've seen it thrown in their face a bunch of times and they're like ah do i have a good one was i born with it how do do i make it better what am i supposed to do yeah so what it is is really with with the nutrition and specifically people's diet people think there's like basically there's two ways there's there's two parts of it i'm either on a diet or i'm off a diet and diet, um, in, in that context, I mean a, a, a caloric deficit. But really, there's four nutrition periodization um, phases. And one is that caloric deficit. Um, the inversely is going to be a caloric surplus where you're eating in a, um, in a surplus of, of what you need to, to put weight on. And maintenance calories, which are defined as the amount of intake energy that keeps your body weight the same, so basically homeostasis, and then reverse. And reverse is really a transitionary period from the bottom of a deficit, you know, back up towards maintenance or even, you know, reversing through maintenance towards a uh, surplus. And what the metabolic performance protocol is, is what I found with like even my own diet or working with, with clients is when you proceed by a large calorie deficit or in any calorie deficit phase with really kind of equal parts of time spent in maintenance or even time spent in a surplus, it makes that diet phase much, much simpler. So I'm sure there, you know, people may have experience with going through trying to diet and it's like, it just seems like it's not working. Like hunger's out of, out of, out of control. You're super, yeah. weak, it sucks. But then there might be another time where you dieted where it was like freezing and you're like, you know, I feel I'm, I'm satiated. The weight's just falling off. Stress is low. And what it really is, is it's, you know, giving your body an, an ample environment to thrive with a, short, you know, you know, short is a relative term, but calculated duration of a diet. So what the metabolic performance protocol is, is I'm taking those people, coaching them through the four periodization phases to set themselves up best to, you know, come out of it lean uh, in a really, you know, uh, 
body composition that, that they're comfortable with. And what, what I like most about it is I'm not, you know, we don't end at the bottom of your diet. We end when we reverse you back to maintenance. Yeah. So it's, they get to see, you know, we get, we go through that kind of full, that full cycle and curve and it's yeah. just how to, how to do the periodization. Um, yeah. Safe. You know, I coach everyone through it, do their numbers. You know, we have weekly calls where we, you know, talk about all sorts of stuff. We go through a bunch of simple recipes, all sorts of it. So beautiful, yeah. dude. Are you cooking? Where are where are we on chicken? Are we about to eat some meat? We are going to get into the green beans first because I only really, I don't want to, I don't want to use the cutting board after the chicken. I don't want to show people bad practices. Hygiene. You don't want to put COVID straight on your cutting board. Yeah. yeah. So what I did already is I chopped up the majority of the green beans and the chicken, so you guys don't have to watch me do that for a really long time. But I, I saved a little bit uh, to show you what I did. So basically, you get it in bunches, right? And then you kind of just line them up with the green beans here. Chop off one end, flip it over. You chop off the other end, and that's just like the, um, I don't know, the ends of the, the green bean, which are a little bit dirty in stems and stuff. And then I usually cut it in half again, too. Especially because this pan's not that big. Yeah. And and then what I have here is garlic. So garlic is the secret weapon for these green beans. It is phenomenal when you when you put them in here. So again, yeah. I, have, I have most of it chopped up already right here, but I have like one little clove left, and I'll show you guys how I chop it up. Again, you cut the ends off, and then you cut it into like little slivers, uh, maybe like five or six cuts per one. And then what you do from there is you just kind of dice it up. And I'm going to use this little technique. Whoa, look at that. Look yeah. at that. So fancy. Yeah, it's very effective. So that's why they do it, not because it looks fancy. <laughs> All right. My knife skills are so below average. <laughs> Dude, I feel like the knife skills is like the – you like you see it on the Food Network, and you're like, "If that guy can do it, I can definitely do it." Like I snatched two twenty five, and that guy's just holding a knife. I could totally do that. Yeah. And then you grab the knife. It's like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna chop my thumb off!" Ah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I have the green beans and the garlic here, and then what I'm going to do is have a little bit of um, olive oil spray here. So with I was talking about a little bit earlier with a, with a lower fat diet, a, a I don't want to call it a problem, but a, a situation that a lot of people run into is they end up eating a lot more fat than they think from the cooking oils that they're using when they cook. Yeah. Um, I have just like a, a spray here. What I really, really like is if you have, especially if you have like a brand of olive oil or avocado oil that you get from like the farmer's market or like a cold press really quality one, there's this product called the Misto. You can get it on Amazon. And what it is is like you like dump your oil inside of it and then it has pump. And you basically turn like your oil into like a spray. Um, so that way cool. you can feel like the one you like, you can use a lot less. Uh, so I'm gonna put a little bit on top here. I'm gonna turn this guy on. I cook it on like basically almost almost high. Um, so like basically a little bit under medium high. And then what I have for this is I'm going to put the fresh garlic that I have here. I also have a little bit of garlic salt which is this says garlic salt. that's my go-to yeah i love and the garlic salt i'll do some fresh ground um black pepper from the grinder salt and pepper from the grinder is game changer what i if, if you're not using salt and pepper from the grinder you're still using like the free the shake whatever, yeah you need to change that. <laughs> grow up what are you in college <laughs> oh my god it tastes so much better um so, the garlic salt on top, not too much, and then the garlic goes on top. Sick. Uh, dude, how long did it take for you to kind of dial in? You've been to what, like five different countries in the last year? Um, we've lived in four countries in the last yeah. We've done like some small trips to other ones and stuff. Um, how long did it take for you to really feel confident um, traveling, feeling like you could get the nutrition you need? I'm sure each time you move, it's like a new, a new battle. Um, yeah. Just trying to figure it out. But 
um, you know, most people that are at their homes still struggle and they have the grocery store that they've always gone to. Um, how much has the travel really added to the, to the complexity or have you just kind of like made it work just because you have to? The only thing that is the most or was the most difficult is sourcing some items in each place. Um, especially like, like the comment I made earlier, like no one does grocery stores like the United States. You might go to a grocery store, like, like, like the first place we went was like Vietnam and the grocery stores were like gas stations. And I was like, Oh, what do I do? <laughs> some Googling, maybe talk to some people, but we think of butchers and stuff. So in Vietnam, we actually had a great butcher who had all this meat imported from Australia and it was delivered. So we cool. got, it was, I mean, it was, that place is actually kind of better than the U.S. I mean, we had everything. You get like beef tenderloin, yeah, shrimp, good tuna, um, chicken. Like the, the chicken that was already cute, which was cool because I didn't have to uh, cut it then. And like that, so that one was really good. Uh, in Bali, was a little bit harder to find uh, some of the qual, like more a variety of meats. So that was a little bit simpler there. Uh, here's been here's been pretty good. The hardest part being here in uh, in Colombia the cuts of meat are completely different names and they're not like you go to Google translate. It's just like, like tenderloin, right? Yeah. That here is just called solomito, but it's not like you can't convert that. You just like, that's just like, it's like two, two different people took cows and like, okay, we're going to cut it this way and call it this, but that it's just like one different way. So that was the hardest because I'm like, well, I have no idea what I'm buying. I have no idea. <laughs> so that's a couple of weeks. But other than that, it was pretty easy. Yeah, well, I, I guess, and you know, one step beyond that, not just sourcing it, but um, being on a low, lower fat diet, um, finding lean cuts of meat is probably relatively challenging, depending upon where you're at and where the where it's sourced from. Yeah, and and, and if they are a little bit fattier, I'll just trim them myself. Um, typically, with chicken's pretty pretty straightforward. Like chicken breast is about as lean as, as you can go. Chicken breast, chicken tenderloin. Um, chicken thighs obviously have a little bit more fat in them. I don't eat much uh, chicken thigh because for the fats that I do eat, I want to have them from, you know, some different sources. Like I eat a, a pretty large protein portion of my diet. So you yeah. get a good amount of saturated fat in just the byproduct of that. So for the fats that I do consume in my diet, I'm going to want those primarily to be poly and mono and saturated fat protein. Love it. That's simpler, but like, yeah, beef, you might have to end up trimming a good amount. Another really lean one that's more prevalent in other areas or other countries, especially here is uh, pork tenderloin. That's like a really good lean cut of pork that yeah. people eat. Really it's really tender, really, really good, easy to cook too. So that's another good one there. Nice. For the green beans, so what I have here is they're in there cooking a little bit. It's been about maybe like two minutes. And then what I like to do is put a little bit of water inside after it's already been cooking and kind of what I call steam fry it. So it's already kind of like a stir fry. And then I just put a little bit of water in there just so just to get the steam building and cook through the vegetables. So one of the biggest aspects with cooking vegetables um, is they get mushy if you cook them a little bit too long. So I purposely like to undercook my vegetables a little bit because I like that like crisp bite to them. I hate mushy vegetables. I don't know yeah. any mushy vegetables. Especially when you're preparing your vegetables to be eaten over, you know, maybe like three or four days after because you're going to reheat them in a pan or maybe you reheat them in the microwave. They're going to cook a little bit more each time. So by the end of it, if you, if you cook them through and they're already like really soft, on like day four, it's literally like soup. And you're like, fuck this, no, this is gross. So I purposely undercook them a little bit so they stay crisp and have a nice bite to them. So from here, I have this, just gonna kind of mix it up a little bit. And I can already smell them. These are gonna be super, super good. And with the vegetables, only need a couple minutes. Probably about two to three minutes on like high heat, you know, with, with uh, just a little bit of like a spray of oil in there and then another like two, three minutes with, with once you put the water in there and they're good to go. Beautiful. Um, also don't just turn the heat off and leave them in the pan because they will still cook a little bit and they can't. Yeah. I recommend taking them off pretty much immediately. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to get into the chicken. Let's do it. 
right, so I have most of the chicken already kind of uh, cubed here in this pot. But what I did is I left one to show you guys how I uh, basically cut it up. So it's nothing fancy. I like to do maybe about like half inch size, maybe like half inch, three quarter inch size cubes, only specifically because like I want it to cook faster. The larger they are, the slower it cooks. Um, the reason I like the cubed chicken is because then when you put the seasoning on it, you get more surface area of the seasoning per you know amount of chicken, and that's really where a lot of your flavor and taste is going to come from. So, you know, kind of chicken breast, especially, kind of gets a bad rap about like, oh, I'm, I hate chicken breast; it tastes gross. But like, people are baking their chicken breast, like, yeah, with like, like some salt, and then like they put it in the oven. Like, of course you need chicken because you're making it in a way that sucks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this has been my favorite way to make chicken, and it's just super, super good when you do it right this way, and it's really, really easy. Yeah. I find that chicken is really delicious on day one, but I struggle on like the leftover side of chicken. Whereas beef, I think just because it's a little bit fattier, I always uh, feel better the next couple days um, until I do a good job cooking the chicken. Until I put, put a little thought into it. Yes. And chicken's exactly. delicious. And that's, yes, yeah, when you, with the, with the right seasonings, and especially when you cook it to that right amount of texture. Yeah. Dry out really easy because it's that's, so, it doesn't have that fat, you can make it dry really quickly. Yeah. And, and when your skill level is like either cooking on high or not cooking at all, that's me. That's yeah. my problem. Another, Gets dried out too easy. Another thing with the, with the cubes, it's easier is because they're smaller, you don't, it's easier to cook more evenly. When you have like, especially when you get with your chicken breast from the grocery store and there's like, they're like four yeah. inch long of chicken Dude, breast. When you get a piece of, when you get a Costco chicken, <laughs> that chicken breast looks like a human chicken breast. Exactly. That chicken weighed like nine pounds. Yeah. So, oh, Franken chicken. It's a little bit easier when you, uh, we're just changing the preparation method. It makes it yeah. Much. So green beans are done already. Like I said, it's only a couple of minutes. I'm gonna finish cleaning out this pan. I'll show you guys what they look like. But here we go. So super good. Um, I'm super excited to, to eat this. Those look delicious. Really, really good. <laughs> I love that you're in Colombia right now. We're cooking together. <laughs> My life is so great right now. That yeah. looked delicious. I want to come eat dinner with you. Yeah. And then that's like the approximate size of chicken, like pretty small, right? Yeah. yeah. So throw those guys in a pot. And now this is like what, this is where it gets good here. So what we do, I put a very tiny amount of olive oil on it just to start, um, like literally like a half second. Mix it up a little bit and then we get into seasoning. So we're done with that one. I don't like to put salt on my chicken. Uh, that's just a personal preference. I know a lot of people do like it, but for me, like salt and egg, or sorry, chicken and eggs, I don't like to put salt on for some reason, so I don't. But then for the seasonings we do have with the chicken, we have the fresh ground black peppercorn, really straightforward. Um, crushed chili pepper that has a little bit of a grinder on top. So you get a little bit of that kick spiciness to the chicken, which is really, really good. Awesome. Paprika here, which gives a little bit more uh, flavor that's really nice with the, um, the, geez, the, the, chili the, chili, the chili plates, and then ground cumin. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite spices. The flavor is just like, even like the aroma you get from it, it's really, really good. It is pretty strong though. So don't like go ham on it or uh, it might overpower you a little bit. And then what I, I load up on my seasonings, right? I think that's like really the difference between like cooking food or having food that you're going to want to eat again in like, you know, a day or two and not when when people like season their stuff or put like a little bit on it, but like I want I want these like when I'm done to be like glistening with all the spices and seasoning that I have on them. Yeah. I really think that's the difference with like um 
cooking is like when you when you can get things seasoned really well versus just a little bit really really changes how it is or how it tastes and how you how you feel about it. especially when you get like when you find those combinations of seasonings that you really like uh i think changes it so one thing that i will say that i prefer to do is i like buying the more basic seasonings and then kind of creating my own like mix as opposed to like buying the like you know mccormick steak seasoning or, or whatever that is so uh but i mean there are some like really good staples as well but i like to kind of get a bunch and that way you can always kind of change it up too so if you're always using the same seasoning it gets easier to kind of get sick of your meals but then when you're changing it up all the time yeah you just kind of go into like self-experiment and then you can think you're fancy and you're like a chef and stuff and i'm not a chef but i'm just a dude who likes to make his own food because I like to have you can food. call yourself a chef. I'm a That's chef. why you got your own cooking show. <laughs> yeah, right. I got my own cooking show. <laughs> um, one re one thing I I find people uh we touched on a little bit earlier when they when they go into making their meats is getting super heavy on sauces, and mm -hmm. not realizing that just mixing it up with the herbs you can get just as much flavor without yeah. all the sugar because there isn't a single sauce out there that isn't just 90 percent sugar with some sauce mixed in it yeah that's a really good point to bring up so one one i'm going to answer this really quickly and then i'm going to uh, go into your question so i put one round of seasoning on it and then i mix it up right and what i'm going to do is put another round of seasoning on the same thing i did and do that again just to really help coat the flavor off around all of it so with that Sauces are basically going to be a combination of carbohydrates and fats, right? And they're not, not, I don't want to say that they're bad or get into any like subjective terminology, but they're not going to like, there's no like, it's not like rice in a sauce. It's going to be mostly uh, a, a liquid form of carbohydrate, obviously a liquid form of, of the, the oil and the fat. And it will, you know, very easily add a lot of uh, caloric content to your meal without with very little um, nutrient density added. So yeah. And oftentimes, like especially in restaurants and stuff, I mean your whole plate comes out in a sauce. Yeah. So, you know, so much more than you most people probably even want. Uh, so I'm not a big sauce guy. Uh, one that we will do a little bit that my girlfriend's been making uh, a nice homemade version of is uh, chimichurri sauce, which is really good on steaks. And also um, some homemade ceviche, which is which has been pretty good too. But like when when you're doing things yourself, you can like kind of look at a recipe and think like, okay, like especially when it comes back to the education and the knowledge you have around your diet, you can say like, okay, well, I don't want milk in it because I'm you know I'm personally lactose intolerant, but I want to strategically pull things from it that I don't think are going to add to much of the flavor for myself, and yeah. I don't want to keep this meal. I, I don't want to have calories from you know grapeseed oil or cottonseed oil or yeah. something like, you know this um i'm not adding brown sugar to my fucking steak or something like that so uh, i think that's a, a really good way that if, if you do like kind of pick a couple and choose but i'm not a big sauce guy um i really like for my structure for my meals and this is something that i uh, heavily encourage everyone else to everyone that i work with to kind of get into as well is following what I call a meal composition structure. And the meal we're making today, it follows that precisely. And it's a primary protein source, a starchy carbohydrate source, and then vegetables. So the fat, I don't typically always include because, as I said, we're getting some from a little bit of the olive oil we're using. Um, food like your chicken is going to have some byproduct of saturated fat from, um, you know, just by nature of, of the, the animal protein source. And then if you are following a higher fat diet, you could always add, you know, some, some fat in there too as well. Or if you, especially if you're pairing with like a, a salad or something like that, you'll yeah. you do fat from that too. And I think what happens with that is you get a nice balanced meal. So you're getting vegetables in at least three times a day, which that's a, a large thing. People just don't eat any vegetables. You are pairing your carbohydrates with a protein source, which will then slow down the digestion of the carbohydrates. So some people who might have some uh, you know, glucose insensitivity or, or blood sugar issues, pairing with a, a, a 
protein and vegetables with the fiber will slow down the digestion, which will help keep your uh, blood sugar levels. And yeah. Also, which is important as well. So, all right, this chicken is good to go. So as you can see, it's really coated up nicely. There's tons of seasoning on there, and this is going to be really, really good. So the difference here, uh, I'm not even going to wash that. I'm going to put a little bit of spray in here. I like to cook the chicken on high. And what I do is basically pop this guy in here. I don't know if these, uh, yeah, I can get it done in one pan. One How many ounces of chicken is that? Do you know, roughly? You know, I couldn't tell you. It's a package from the store that I just opened up and completely cut up. Cool. So, it looked smaller earlier. I was going to guess about four, and then you just put it in the pan, and now it looks like about double that. Oh, no. This is definitely more than four. This is probably, I mean. When it was in the Tupperware, it looked smaller. Oh, that, well, that was, so that was only one in the Tupperware, and I had already cut up some of the other ones. Ah, there we go. Exponential growth chicken. Yeah, the one in the Tupperware is probably, yeah, I would say probably around 100 grams. Yeah. So good that you operate in grams now, so, international traveler. Fortunately for me, I kind of saw the light in operating and switching to grams back when we still lived in the States. Yeah. And it has been a godsend with traveling internationally because everywhere else, no one operates in pounds and stuff. So... That's been really, really nice. And the thing that I like is it it, you know, it, make, it makes your numbers eat more even. Um, especially because like things like you do chicken and steak and stuff in ounces, but then like rice or oats you would do in grams and then certain things are in teaspoons and cups and yeah. you use, it's universal. Everything is grams. So it, it, it really removes any of that, uh, you know, interpretation between each. So, with the pan here, I have a little bit more in here than I normally would like to because you want a little bit of space between them so that they can cook uh, more evenly and easier. But this is a little bit more than I would normally do in here. I probably would normally do this in two batches. And then what I do is, let me check the time. All right. I do three, three minutes on one side on high. I don't mess with it. And then I wait till I can kind of see it cooking through maybe about the middle of the, I mean, you can pretty easily see that it's gonna be really white on the bottom and the top's gonna be pretty pink. Yeah. And what I do is I mix it all around and then I flip over each of the, you know, cubes so that they're face down now. I do another three minutes, uh, about six minutes in total and the chicken's done. Cool. Another really easy way to tell if it's nearing done, if you're like new cooking and you don't wanna like leave it on there forever or you don't wanna pull it too early and it's completely raw, if you take like a plastic spatula like this one and you can split one of the bigger pieces easily, it's done. So yeah, I'm gonna spread these out a little bit more so we'll cook evenly. And uh, if you were home by yourself uh, and not being interrupted by me all the time, how long does this meal typically take you to cook? 20 minutes, 10? Not even like the rice cooker's been done. It's been done for probably 10 minutes. <laughs> Imagine if I was your roommate. Oh my God, nothing would ever get done. Yeah. So, I mean, especially if you have two pans, like, right? I did the chicken in um, one pan because we've been talking, but what I would do is prep everything first. And then I'd put the, the green beans in one pan, the chicken in the other. And I think, like, if I was uninter uninterrupted and just jamming in the kitchen with my headphones, yeah. Guys, I think 11, 12 minutes. Listening to Barbell Shrugged, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think that I use me on like 11 or 12 minutes. Uh, yeah. I feel like um, – Sorry. When you think that it's like – What's nice about this is it's not like this is like a one-meal thing for me. I have extra for another meal. Yeah, right? So it's like 10 minutes, but you eat – get half your food for the day in there. Yeah. How often do you eat out? Eating well, out has been probably the thing that has been the most – not eating out, I should say, has been the – I feel awful not supporting a lot of the restaurants around here. But, oh, my gosh, do I feel better not having all the stuff, whatever they put in it. Yeah, so it is – with – I – so I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm not a big eating out person to begin with. Yeah. Um, 
what happened was there's a point. So when I first kind of started, I was awful for food, like God awful. And I would botch everything. But then eventually, um, I at one point I had a roommate who really liked me and him would make stuff on the grill all the time. And that's when my like cooking, you know, knowledge and, and, and being decent at it really took off. And we got to the point where we like we'd go out to dinner and we get like this like fat steak from a steakhouse or whatever. And I'm like, I can do better than this. And that, once that happened, that really kind of changed how I felt about eating out. And also I like having control. And for a lot of people, it, most things when you go to a restaurant, they're gonna be cooked in butter. Um, or when they are, when they do use an oil, it's gonna be a really low quality or like, I'm sorry, the restaurants aren't cooking your steak or your chicken in you know, a fresh pressed olive oil or avocado oil you're getting. No, straight up canola. Canola oil, yeah. So gross. All you going to you know decrease a little bit, and you just have less control. I mean, when you're really estimating with your calories, which is fine, but I think you know it, it's a really interesting period with everything going on right now. The quarantines is a lot of people for maybe the first time are you know having to cook most of their food themselves, and they're they're getting some you know insight in that. But what I would recommend for most people. Um, if you're just like, hey, I want to like make some healthier decisions. I'm, you know, want to want to improve my body composition a little bit. I would try and set your your meals out to to two or less, kind of like free ones, you know. Yeah. Uh, where you know you're not going to be able to track it. Certain places like um, Chipotle, or my favorite being the flame flame broiler, which is only you know usually on mostly on the West Coast. Those ones I feel like are a really good intermediary. Was like you can really. Because at, at, at um, Chipotle, you're getting the same thing every time, right? And they have their, their menus released. They're in chronometer. I can track my Chipotle order in literally 30 seconds. I go through, multi-select everything, boom. Very, very simple. Yeah. Places like that, I think, are like really good go-tos. You know, I think having like maybe two to three go-to places for when you like, if you get back from like a business trip and there's no food in the house and you're starving, but you don't want to like grab, you know, whatever. Totally. Like, you know, like more quality that are, kind of fast food options but yeah the more that you can restrict your eating out the better off you're gonna be my favorite when i go to chipotle is the guy that doesn't give a fuck anymore about his job and you're like can i get double chicken and he's like look i'm gonna give you quadruple <laughs> and i'm not even gonna charge you for the double and you're like dude i would totally not hire you but i love you yeah i appreciate it what you're <laughs> yeah yeah. If you did this to my business, you'd just be giving away all my programs for free. Chipotle <laughs> <laughs> is one of those weird things because people, some people consider it like a fast food, um, but when you when you look at it, you're getting a, you're getting a lean protein source which you have which you have control over. You know, you yep. can go to the route or, or the the steak, but you can just go with like the chicken. You are getting. Um, Options for a complex carbohydrate, which is going to be beans or white or brown rice, which beans are going to have a little bit of, um, you know, your, your, your protein in as well. You stack the uh, fajita vegetables, so you're getting some onions, bell peppers. I think it's onions and bell peppers, just that. And then you can get like the pico de gallo in it, which has some, some tomato, some more onion. And you can, I mean, you can really put together a really decent quality meal. So you can have your primary protein source, whether you chicken, steak, whatever. You can have your rice or your beans or both for your starchy carbohydrate and then you can load your, your protein right there and if like say you are someone who wants to have more fat in your diet you have the block which is going to be a pretty decent fat source yeah with and it's a i mean i i think it's a great meal and it's something that like is you know pretty cost effective for what yeah you get. the it's only good. thing you're going to run into really at chipotle is the oil it's a little funky yeah. there's something in the oil and then you mix the little chipotle sauce in there and it gets a little weird but you'll get over it and I'm at six minutes on these guys. And let me do my test here to see if I can split one. Uh, not quite yet. So I'm going to give it a little bit more. Um, that one's split pretty easily, but I'll give it another minute um, before we're done there. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, the. Um, the, the cooking out with, or sorry, the eating out with Chipotle is, is I think is decent because you get a, a you get a, you get a decent amount of food. Um, yeah. You are, when you get into, like, I mean, I'm not a massive food and I'm, you know, 200 pounds. 
but I'm eating 3,000 plus calories a day. Uh, when you get into some of the, like some questions I, I'll get a lot about is like um, meal prep companies and going that route. And for some people, that's a very, very good option. But oftentimes you're getting 400 calorie meals, you know, usually. And at, you know, nine to or like eight, twelve dollars a pop, like you know, a four hundred calorie meal. I need like seven of those per day to get to seventy percent of my daily calories. It's just yeah. not, it's not cost effective for most people to do like consistently over time. Do you um, find it hard eating that much still? What's up? Do you find it hard to eat that much still? No, I mean the only time before. Um, before you know, Corona hit and everything. I was uh, personally with my own goals. I was trying to put muscle on. I was eating specifically to gain weight, and I was encroaching on the four thousand calories uh, per day mark. And that did get a little bit of uh, a chore because, like, say, say something happened with like work. I had like a really long day, or I had a bunch of calls or something, and I missed like a meal. Now I'm you're way behind the eight ball. I'm way behind the eight ball, and there's yeah. like a for that. But yeah. That was, really it but i mean other than that like i like a really large breakfast i'm one of those people i wake up starving in the mornings which makes yeah. sense asking from you know 8 p.m 9 p.m whenever we have that last meal or six in the morning and most people don't think about it that way but yeah uh, also fasting roughly you know 12 hours per day anyway so i'll have like a really big breakfast there and then with now that I, um, you know, when I have full control of my schedule, so I like to train in the middle of the day, and that helps with appetite and stuff, getting bigger meals in earlier as opposed to, you know, trying to play catch up tonight. All right, these guys are done. Let's do it. Let's see that meal. All right, so I don't remember which plate has a chicken on it, so I'm going to start fresh. <laughs> All right, so and this is how I build out my meals. When people are, or I get questions about like, well, how do I fit my meals into my macros and stuff? And what I really do is like, we have our calories, right? Sit on top. Calories easily break down in your macronutrients, what you know. And then when coming back to having your structure, um, let's say to make it really simple so I don't mess up the math and I'm live with everyone. Say I'm eating 2,000 calories, right? Uh, I think for most people, three to six meals per day is going to be best. I don't like doing less than that because what ends up happening is you end up um, having a monster 17, 1800 calorie dinner, which people do, which when you're really looking for body composition and stuff, eating, you know, 85% of your dinner at, at two hours before bed from a, from how we partition calories and stuff and from a physiological and kind of um, uh, daytime point, it's just not going to be best for most people. More than seven becomes almost kind of ridiculous because you're eating literally every, you know, 120 minutes or less. Um, personally, I like the, the sweet spot of around four meals. So let's say I have 2,000 calories. Um, I'm going to do four meals. So I know that's going to be roughly 500 calories per meal. Carbohydrate and fat aren't as hard for people to plan with because yeah. they're it's easy to, you know, carbs are everywhere. Most people aren't like, hey man, I can't hit my carbs each day. Um, fat is easier, easier as well because I specifically follow a lower fat diet. Protein is what's hard for people. So if I know, um, let's say I want to hit protein right at body weight and instead of 200 pounds, that means having 50 grams of protein per meal. So when you think about it that way, you have your calories, you have your macronutrients, you know how many meals per day you're eating. It gets very, very simple to know, okay, I have chicken. I know that 100 grams of chicken is X amount of protein. You can memorize really small numbers like that uh, or little sets. And then you just kind of, it's very simple math. So yeah. when you grab my food scale, this is my food scale I get oh. all the time. It's from Joseph Joseph, it's on Amazon, really inexpensive, but it folds up, which is cool. You can travel and this is like, I don't know, about the size of like a phone, half the width or so. And it's pretty sweet. What I like about it is though, I can see the scale, the numbers when I have a full dinner plate on it. Which yeah. Is cool. So, all right, here we go. I'm going to do. And you're calculating all this off of cooked weight, not raw weight, right? So really good question. What's, what I like is, so when I, I, I spoke about chronometer a few times, I have really, good consistent entries and they have a lot of entries for cooked meats 
Uh, so like the entry that I'm going to use that I normally use is chicken breast cooked, um, skin removed before cooking, right? Really simple. But if you don't have that entry or you just want to know, a really good rule of thumb is your, is your, your, your meat cooked is going to weigh 75% of what it weighed raw. And I've actually done this test myself across um, chicken, beef, and pork, and they were all between 75 and 77%. So I just use 75%, or like I said, when I have the, the entries that I use consistently, which makes it easier, but that's a really good way to, to look at it. So cool. you have, you know, four, in, in speaking in freedom units, if you have four ounces, it's going to be three ounces um, cooked. Cool. But really All right, so what I typically range out to be around 150 grams per meal, um, especially if I'm having those four meals per day. Uh, I have 160 here, and I'm good with that. You can go over stronger. Yeah, yeah. and then I will um, I will write these down. I'll see if I can remember them and look them up. Okay, and then vegetables. So I recommend everyone, I really, really think you should be striving for at least a pound of vegetables per day. That's going to be about 450 grams. Um, I always aim for over 500, and I always try and do at least 150 grams of vegetable for each um, meal. So the thing with vegetables is with that kind of 500 target, you want to be aiming for a mix of what I call low, medium, and high density vegetables. So if I'm like, hey, Anders, I need you to eat 500 grams of vegetables each day, and you're like, okay, and you try and eat that from spinach, like it, it's gonna be hard. Yeah, you're probably gonna like split your stomach line. <laughs> um, but then if you like get it from like carrots, which are like a high density vegetable, that you know it would be not that hard. Um, that's probably like a bag of like baby carrots, which you can sit on the couch and eat. It's like when you're watching Netflix or something. Like that. So, like a mix. I would say something like these green beans are going to be a medium density vegetable. Another medium density vegetable would be like um, broccoli. Your low density vegetables are going to be like your kale, your, your kind of like leafy type greens. And then yeah. your high density ones are going to be like some of some of like the roots, like your carrots or. Um, I don't know, I can't think of any other ones, but like maybe like uh, uh, bell peppers and stuff like that too, which are a little bit heavier for the weight. So I have 160 grams of my uh, green beans. And next, let's get into the rice cooker. So I can pour this side, which has been done for a while. Where's that guy at? Uh, here we go. And then with rice, um, I'll usually do equal to about a little bit more than my um, protein, depending on you know how much I'm eating in, in, in with my carbohydrates per, per day. So I know with cooked white rice, it is about 180 grams of cooked white rice is going to equal uh, approximately 50 grams of carbohydrate. Because I know I'm doing a little bit more than 50 with my um, chicken, I'm going to shoot for about the same. Maybe a little less. So I'm going to zero out my scale. And then... Sick rice spoon. Oh, the rice cooker spoon is the best. And that's 180 on the dot. And then what you can see from like a, a plate standpoint is they're roughly equal, right? So I have about my plate split into thirds, my primary protein source, my starchy carbohydrate source, and my fresh vegetables. Um, this is a really quality meal. Uh, this is something that I will, like 90% of my weekly meals look just like this, not these specific foods. But yeah. like I have maybe beef tenderloin, excuse me, broccoli and sweet potato, or I have tuna and a combination of like, um, onions and bell peppers and then lentils or something like that and it's really simple going back to that you know meal matrix i spoke about in the beginning you could pick your like 10 favorite foods like i have one uh, on my my instagram my facebook if you want to go look for that where i have like my 10 most commonly in proteins 
starches, you know, I go from there. And that is like literally what 99% of my diet looks like. Yeah. From one off times we go out, you know, to eat or I'm traveling or something like that and you get something in the interim. Um, one thing that I will quickly speak about with specifically fats and fruit, I think those make the most sense to have more as like a snack um, or with breakfast. So I'll usually do some sort of berry with my breakfast as well. Yeah. And then, you know, if you want to do with, with that structure, going back to that, if you want to do three meals and a, and a snack or something like that, like pairing of vegetable and a fat source uh, are really good there. Because what with the snack is you don't want to have to like cook your snack. It should be something you can grab and eat, you know, really quickly. So like walnuts or almonds or something like that's going to be really easy there with like some blueberries, strawberries, maybe a banana and apple or something like that. Yeah. Dude, we just ran a cooking show on the internet from multiple different countries. Yeah, multiple continents. Continents. How to make meals to build muscle. How <laughs> savage. Um, dude, I'm going to put all your information in the show notes. Cool. Um, this is savage. I can't wait for you to get back to the uh, United States, man. You're only going to be a couple couple hours away from me, which is rad. Three hours away, which would be cool.